Hey, this is Hollis, and you're watching the Ambiance Podcast. What up, everybody? Welcome back to Ambiance Podcast. I'm sitting with Hollis Wong Ware. That's how you say it, right? That's how you say it. Okay, awesome. And she is a singer, songwriter, musician, activist, a whole lot of different things, right? Out of um, out of it. originally out of the Bay Area, right, mm-hmm. and now currently resides in Los Angeles and kind of hybrid between um, Seattle, right? Yep. Awesome. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm a little. It's hot because it's just hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's August in Los Angeles, so it's just a hot. Vibe, yeah, but it's yeah. just it's just hot. It's a hot season. Um, yeah. I really want to get into a lot of the creation process behind how you make your music, and then also the variety of other creative arts that you're involved in. Oh. But at first, I kind of wanted to just get a good idea of how Hollis became the amazing creative that she kind of is today, right? So I feel like there's some things to unpack from the beginning of your life leading up to today. Sure. So were there any like indications of you being like exposed to creative arts when you were younger? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting when when you just said that, like what created who I am today and like maybe why am I like multifaceted or I, you know, I have all these kind of outputs and I think, you know, there's some, I think, Steve Jobs quote, which is like, you can never connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back, right? And so when I think about it, like both of my parents were entrepreneurs, which, mm. at, you know, obviously your parents are just your parents when you're growing up, but it was pretty unusual at the time, right? So like my mom uh, owned a Chinese restaurant when I was growing up and she, you know, like managed that. And then my dad was a contractor and he built playgrounds for a living, like mm. at schools and parks. And even though those things don't seem like they're connected at all to necessarily like being a musician or being an artist. I think, well, I think both of them were kind of like artists in their own way. And I think had to make do with what they had and like, you know, came from, um, you know, tough backgrounds and and needed to kind of make a way for themselves. And they didn't really frankly have the privilege and the space and the resources to be artists, even though they're both pretty creative. Um, but I think that like entrepreneurial spirit and kind of like creating your own thing and making your own way. Like I think now looking back, you know, even though at the time when I was an artist, like as a teenager and as a, in my twenties, like thinking, oh wow, I like couldn't be more different from my parents. Like now looking back, I'm like, oh, actually I'm completely following their footsteps. And I just had the ability and the resources to be able to actualize my own entrepreneurial endeavor, which happened to be my art, um, instead of, you know, what they did, which was like construction and be, and restaurant, like owning a restaurant. So, um, I think that has a lot to do with who I am. And it also means just like to be an entrepreneur, you have to do a hundred things. And I think like any creative in 2021 knows that like you have to be able to do a hundred things to say that you're doing one thing. So I think, (laughs) you know, and I think that for me, it's just that kind of spirit. Like my mom would always say, cause I basically grew up in her restaurant. Right. And like was working there. I was like, seating people with menus when I was like four or whatever, like something wild. And she had always told me like at a restaurant, like there, there's never nothing to do, right? There's always something you can do there. You can never just sit there and twiddle your thumbs. And, you know, there's always something that you can busy yourself with to like make things better. And I think I really like, I think I really like, um, have always held that to be true. Like there's always something that you can do. And again, as creatives in 2021, we already know, like there's always a way that you can level up. Yeah. You're never, done. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I think that that, you know, I mean, obviously like there's ways in which like I developed musically as at a young age or as a performer at a young age or what have you, or as a writer. But I think like the true foundation of myself as an artist really comes from like that background and them, and them being the people who raised me. Yeah. And I think some of it can even be subliminal, right? Like maybe you Mm -hmm. didn't realize it back then, but like you said, as you got older, you realize like, wow, my mom's entrepreneurship plays a role because you're like, you're an independent artist right now. Correct. So a lot of the, what you do, you have to wear probably multiple hats for yourself. Of course. And I can relate that to what I do. You know, I like talking, I podcast, but (laughs) I don't have to just know this. I have to know how to light. I have to know how to like set the proper settings on my camera. Like you can't just do the one thing. You have to learn that there's steps to it, right? Completely. And I think, you know, that's more than most artists, I think today are like that. We have to be multifaceted. We have to be really self of self, uh, contained. Mm -hmm. We have to be really efficient. Um, and we have to know how to do a lot with a little. And I mean, it's amazing. Like even just thinking about like the last music video I put out, we shot 80% of it on an iPhone. Really? Like just the phone I'm talking and texting on every day. 
Which song we was that? We shot it for Less Like. For Less Like. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go check it um, out our, My DP, Haley Blavka, is like an amazing photographer, and she shoots with like film and photo, but she was like, honestly, I feel like we could get a lot of these shots on an iPhone. And I was like, for real, an iPhone? And then you're looking at the quality, and you're just like, damn. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, we have the resources, we have the tools, but we also mm. have to be really scrappy. And like, I think a lot of us, more than meets the eye, like we're all in that way. Yeah, you know? and it's easier than ever nowadays to do something like that because like you said, the resources are out there, like YouTube, especially digitally. I mean, maybe not right. um, physically, but oh, yeah. if you want to start something or learn how to do something, you can do it. There's oh, yeah. no excuse YouTube not to. University. YouTube like, University. Why, why go to school? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, honestly, every guest that I've had on that's creative has like, harped on YouTube University. Right. And everybody who's like successful in the art has like, has coined something from YouTube, you know what Straight I mean? Up. Yeah, absolutely. When you were younger, since we're kind of already on that subject still, what were some of your early inspirations outside of, of course, your mother and your father? What are some early inspirations that um, have an impact on your art today? I'm like Celine Dion <laughs> was hey. my icon. Whitney Houston bodyguard soundtrack was it. everything for me. Um, Very yeah, soulful. I don't know. What's up? Very soulful. I mean, yeah, but it's just like what was the reigning like music of the day. It's funny. I don't feel like I came from a particularly musical household. Like I never, my grandmother was a singer, but I never met her. So oh, like okay. in some ways, you know, when I started singing, my family was like, oh, you're channeling your grandmother's spirit. But she was never in my life per se. And I, yeah, again, like we didn't really listen to a ton of like music growing up in my house. In fact, like when I remember like the music that I was really drawn to, it usually felt like forbidden. Like I remember really? like a friend, I think I was like in fifth grade and I got TLC's crazy, sexy, cool, mm. like a cassette tape for like my birthday. And it was like contraband. Like my mom was like, where is this from? And I was just like, no music. <laughs> like I, like, it's funny because it kind of always felt like this, like, rebellious thing in a certain like, sense. I'm not like, supposed to be doing this, but... Right, yeah. well, popular music, right? So, yeah. like, I... Ever since I was five, I sang in choir. And it was very, mm. like, it was a very formal thing. I think it was kind of, like, the thing to teach me, like, discipline and, like, working with others and... um it was kind of like a proper way to express myself vocally. I think my mom always knew that I loved to sing and she wanted me to do it the most proper way. Or if I was singing, it was like classical, you know, and later I would do like musical theater. But it was kind of, there was kind of like this formality and the stateliness to it. And I think I was always really drawn to, yeah, popular music. And so like, I think about when I was in, in middle school, like I got really into, well, my generation, the Pen15 generation, we got really into like chat rooms and then chat rooms got into message boards. And so I mm. had this whole other life online and like the dial up internet era of like connecting with people about like underground culture. So like I was really into Riot Girl. I was really into making zines. I had like a whole community of people on a message board that we all just like you know, I, I learned about music that way. I learned about punk rock that way. I learned about like feminism and radical feminism that way. And it was all like, no, my parents had no idea. It was like all hella secret. Right. And yeah. then through that, I think with the same kind of thrust and then also being from the Bay area, um, I started getting into hip hop and that like, and it, this is at the like lime wire mm. takes four hours to download one song ass honestly time. yeah and and the fact that it took so long to get those songs for free like made Correct. it that much more cherishable for you i feel like right totally. and I, <laughs> th I mean this is music that i wouldn't even had even if i wanted to pay for it i wouldn't have been able to get it because it's like we're talking about bands like from like you know middle of nowhere that they're just have to have this mixtape that this one person has and then they're able to you know it's just like stuff where it, it the obscurity of it and like not it, it's not like today where you could just like google something in media or like every single song's on spotify like it really was this like you had to hunt down and find this stuff that was like you had that became your cultural and musical universe. Right. And I think there was something that always really drew me to kind of like the underground stuff, the hidden stuff, like, you know, the DIY kind of element. Um, and so like, whether it was like the riot girl or the more like punk stuff or like the kind of like very kind of dreamy, like garagey rock, um, or it was like super independent hip hop, like, you know, like Def Jux was like a huge label for me and like Aesop Rock and Cannibal Ox and like all these kind of like almost obscure to the point of esoteric <laughs> rappers where I'm like, I don't really understand half of what you're saying, but I'm like so into it. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, it just, that was what I was so compelled by because it felt like contraband. Yeah. It felt like 
this clandestine like other world that was like so different from me growing up in like the suburban bay area yeah and i think it's cool that and there's something to be said about the fact that like you seeked out that type of stuff so it really says uh something that you were interested in it so much to seek it out right i feel like nowadays it's like social with social media and all these streaming platforms there's so much things getting recommended to us and thrown in our face that sometimes it's not really up to us what we want to see but being that you were seeking out that that type of music and that type of culture yeah. it just goes to show how interested you are in you know in it you know totally and i think you know to that end it was really like me seeking out community as well i mm. think like you know i mean every every kid i think feels kind of like an outlier and an outsider growing up but i definitely felt that way when i was a kid and like being on these message boards and like what you're saying it like was not easy it wasn't recommended for you yeah. this was on some stuff where you had to like really hack in and like figure out how you were finding people and you know making friends from all these random ass places like boston and like baltimore and like you know the middle of the country like all sorts of stuff and the people you would never otherwise like even interact with or know how to find out and you were just like all happened to be at this one weird corner of the internet together and there's a type of like really amazing community that came out of that because it was like all these people who kind of felt like they were isolated in their own thing and coming together and like I don't know like I think the first thing I ever really made of my own was zines and like that whole idea of like creating something that's like self-published like I'm I'm like I'm still doing that shit I just like and now it's music but <laughs> it's like just a different you know form. the idea of like go, like going to Kinko's and like doing the whole collage and then printing it yourself and then sending it and like having it be distributed at like just the whole thing like that's always really driven me I think and I've it's really fascinated me and it always made me feel not so alone yeah I love it. I want to go back to something you said earlier about um, being from the Bay Area. Yeah. There's a lot of talented artists and creatives from the Bay Area. Oh, yeah. So I just want to know what type of impact did the Bay Area have on you during your um, adolescent years? And then uh, why do you think it's like there's something in the water? Like why? Is so yes, many talented the Bay Area creators? is like the <laughs> cultural epicenter of the it world. Really is. I love the Bay. I'll always rep the Bay. I mean, like the thing is, I'm a West Coast girl. Like, the Bay Area is where I was born and raised and where I was, like, really, like, you know, I was first sparked as an artist. And then I'll always rep Seattle because um, I'm so, like, still really close with the community there. And, like, that was really the place where I feel like I came up as an artist. The Bay Area, though, like, we do, we never get enough credit for the impact that we make culturally. Some people know, like, some know. But, like, just throughout the ages, I think especially for me, like, that whole era of like DJ Shadow, Lyrics Born, Mm -hmm. uh, Hieroglyphics, you know, like uh, Guapale, like just that, like it was such a golden era, like not to mention obviously just like everyone with the hyphy movement, E-40, an absolute icon, Mac Dre, RIP, but like the godfather of Bay Area rap, just like we had the creativity from the Bay Area is to me completely unparalleled. There's yeah. just like an originality from the Bay. Like we've started so much, and I say we, like I, I'm just thankful to have B say hey, that I'm from there. Like yeah. I did not come up with the slang that has <laughs> defined a generation, but like the Bay has. And you know, obviously there's still artists like that come out today. Like mm-hmm. you look at a Kaylani or like, you know. Nudes, Pilo. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah fuck with Pilo. Um, but just, you know, there's hella artists that come out and are still kind of like, you know, on the cutting edge, but it was a really exciting place to be from. Like when I was a teenager, especially when I ended up going to high school in San Francisco and okay. like, cause I had been in the North Bay. So like Sonoma County, and then I went to, you know, middle school in Marin County. And then when I finally went to high school in San Francisco, like it totally opened up like a wide ass world for me. And I was like, oh shit, like, this is what it's like to be from an urban center. This is what it's like to be like from a city that, you know, at that point hadn't been pricing out all of its yeah, artists and creatives not and, gentr- and its working class. Yet. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, is any city never gentrifying? Probably not. Mm-hmm. Like, was it, was, was there income inequality when I was in high school? Absolutely. But the ways in which it was like hyper accelerated in tech, yeah. um, you know, I always thought I was going to move back to the Bay after after college. I went mm. to college in Seattle, and I always thought I was going to move back, and I wanted to live on the East Bay like you lived in, like that yeah. North Oakland area. Like that's definitely so much where culture I, there. It's oh so yeah, rich. no, I mean, yeah. I just like was like, this is it. Like East Bay is it. I want to live here. Like I want to be here. I want to I want to grow here. And when I came back after college, already on the I was seeing the writing on the wall, and I was like, if I don't work in tech. I am going to struggle. Like, yeah. it's not going to be cute. And then the wild ass thing is that, like, you know, 10 years later, Seattle's the same damn thing with Amazon. <laughs> and I'm like, is it me? Is it, is, the it really? is, is it wherever I live? Oh, hell yeah. Oh, my God. It's crazy. Cost of living just follows you. 
Right. I know. It's like, I'm the struggle. So, um, no, no, no. But yeah, I mean, it's sad to have seen like, even in the years that I was in Seattle from like 2005 until I left in 2015 to come here, just the amount of development gentrification and like the, you know, the aggravation of the wealth inequality there that pushed so many people out of the city. It's like really sad to see, especially creatives. Yeah, you know, for sure. Because it's the heart of the of wherever you live. Yeah, most definitely. So you lived in Seattle for ten years. I did. Yeah. Wow. So what brought you there initially? Was it college? College. Yeah. So okay. I went to Seattle University, and um, yeah. So I and I, I, you know, the same. I wanted to live in a city. I think I, there was other places I could have gone to college. But they were all pretty isolated. It was that like typical liberal arts, like out in the middle of nowhere experience, which I think can be kind of cool for folks to like kind of incubate you in your own little reality. But I really wanted to be like in a city and just make sure that like wherever I was, there was like real culture around and not just like what 18 to 22 year olds were cooking up. <laughs> yeah. What, what made you stay in Seattle after graduating for so long? So part of that is really when I came back to the Bay, like, you know, I, I think it was like the summer after I had graduated and I was kind of like, okay, like, could I live here? Like I have a job in Seattle, like I have people in Seattle, but like, do I want to move back to the Bay and make this my home? And I think I just started thinking like at that point, you know, I was in my first music group ever, which was a rap group with my friend Maddie, um, called Canary Sing, and she would actually eventually move to Oakland, and she's like oh, an amazing wow. MC and educator that lives and has been repping Oakland for, at this point, over 10 years. But, um, you know, her and I were doing our thing, we were making music, and I came down to the Bay, and I was like, you know what, like, first of all, I kind of have momentum going musically and within community in Seattle, and secondly, it's just like the folks that I'm tapped in with in the Bay are really struggling. Like, they're really having a hard time connecting with each other, venues are disappearing, there's just like not the infrastructure and the support that I felt like there was up in Seattle, like let alone just the cost of living. Yeah. So, and yeah, again, like I kind of had the momentum going, like when I graduated from college, me and my friend had been in our rap group for a couple of years and we had been performing and we knew people and I was just kind of like, I feel like there's something happening here that um, I want to see through um, musically. And yeah, I mean, I think it ended up being the right decision. I think if I had moved back to the Bay, I would have felt that pressure to be like, oh, okay, how can I like make my desire to be within community and within culture, like how can I like kind of professionalize that? And yeah. I can see myself going on this path where I would have like, you know, with all due respect to everybody who does this, but like worked at a nonprofit or worked at like a cultural institution and kind of like found a way to like make a real job out of like the thing that I was most passionate about. I think in Seattle at the time, it was affordable enough. I had the resources, I was connected enough and to be able to be like, well, let me make a go of this as like an artist. Yeah, I think it's really cool that you got the chance to be in San Francisco or the Bay Area um, in general so long. And then you also got a chance to be in Seattle so long because both of those areas have a really, really um, good like music culture. Like they have yes. a good music scene out there. And totally. I'm, I'm, I don't know as much about Seattle. I visited there a few times, yeah. but I know that they do have a really good music scene out there as well. So I think, I think that's cool. Cause I feel like you probably take both of those from you with you today. And then also Los Angeles as well. Right. Like a lot of people get the chance to be exposed to these variety of different musical cultures. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean like, you know, every city has their thing. I think, yeah, the Bay area, especially when I, I mean, for me, the Bay area, like the, the music that most impacted me I mean frankly in the Bay and in Seattle was hip hop mm -hmm. like you know obviously like there's a lot of like really classic amazing like rock music that's come out of this region and same too obviously with Seattle like iconic Nirvana. rock scene but um, you know and I've, I've always been kind of like there's always been like an alternative you know heart within me but at the same time it's just like I was like explicitly like crafted by the hip hop community and like culture and music like in the Bay as like a fan and then like in Seattle, like within the actual community and the artistic community itself. Gotcha. Switching gears here a little bit um, to go to you more about your music career. When did you decide or at what point in your career did you decide that you wanted to make a living out of music or you wanted to pursue it more seriously rather than just a hobby? Totally. So, you know, it's interesting, like in Seattle, and I think this really just speaks to, it speaks to this moment in time, because I don't know if we'll ever get back to, I mean, first of all, I'll, I'm just older and I'll never be there again, but also there was just like this really gorgeous like energy and vibe, and we kind of like, maybe every generation calls their youth like the golden years, but we definitely refer to it as the golden years of Seattle hip hop in that like, 
you know, Twitter was basically a chat room. There was no IG. There's no streaming. There's not, there you, there's just only going to shows and there's only like mm. going out and connecting with people IRL. Right. And when I moved to Seattle in the same way that I was like a huge fangirl of Bay Area rap, I moved to Seattle and I became a huge fangirl of Seattle rap. So um, my favorite band was called Blue Scholars. They're a hip hop duo. Um, and I just love their lyricism. I just thought they were like the shit and so I like memorized all their songs and I like went and go saw them perform and I was like a huge fan huge fan of Macklemore's first album like that dropped in 2005 who you ended up actually working with who I ended up actually working with and so my whole this is the long winded ass story is basically (laughs) just like when I started making music I became cool with and then friends with and then like basically fam with all of the people that I was a fan of. So it was like Blue Scholars. I was a huge fan. I ended up like basically co-managing them for three years and going on the road with them as a tour manager. And that was really like to answer your question, working with them initially, like they were the biggest rap group in Seattle. Like Macklemore was famous, but he was opening for Blue Scholars. So when I got the opportunity after a number of years to like be cool with them and then finally to work with them and alongside them, they had, they were a successful independent artist. They were going on the road. They were playing, you know, they sold out the Troubadour when we went on tour here. They were like, you know, Bowery Ballroom up in, out in New York. Like they had a very uh, viable business. Like they, they had fans like myself that like really loved them that were down to buy their merch. Uh, we did a Kickstarter for their album. I got to see like up close and personal, like the actual economics of being an independent artist and, and how you make that happen. Right. And I think it was then that I was like, okay, I love making music more than anything. I just really love being with people and creating things with people and collaborating with people. And it didn't have to just be music. It could be a music video. It could be like live events. It could be whatever. Um, but I think when I worked with blue scholars who, again, I had like really idolized and then got to see the nuts and bolts of like the back end of their business and like how they actually made it work. I was like, okay, I could make this work. Like I could like this now I'm kind of like seeing how the sausage is made. I can kind of understand. It's not just this like ethereal, like success, like floating in lights and then me just kind of, you know what I mean? And yeah. I, I'm a pretty practical person. So I think I'd always told myself like, okay, like music is a hobby. I love to make music, but that's not a real job. Mm-hmm. And so when I finally work with folks that I was like, oh, okay, this is your real job and it is viable and it does work. And how can this happen? And all of, again, back to what we were talking about before, the 100 skills that yeah. it takes to be successful at one thing. I really learned it, like, working alongside them. And then when I started working with Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, it's the same shit. I was like, how can I, you know, I started collaborating with them as a music video producer, a pro oh, wow. bono music music video producer. Because I was just like, I just want to work alongside you. You just want to be involved. And be of use to you, precisely. Yeah. And so that I can learn how y'all are doing this. Because, like, how do you run your business? What is it like on the back end? Again, back to my little entrepreneurial <laughs> foundation. Um, how does this work? Yeah. You know, for me, it was not even, I wasn't compelled by the idea of like, ah, I'm going to be singing at a festival. I was like, how, how does this work at the end of the day? How do I make sure that I'm like not setting myself up for failure? Um, so yeah. Talk about how that full circle moment must have felt like being of such a fan of Macklemore than being able to actually work with him and right. getting involved on that, like Grammy nomination, right? Totally. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting. Like it took a while. Like I was a fan of him when I, when I, um, moved to Seattle 2005 when he had just released his, his like debut solo album. Um, and I didn't actually really get to know him until like many years later. And it was only because, uh, the DJ and producer from blue scholars, um, his brother was a music video director and he approached me, we were friends and he approached me and he was like, yo, I'm looking for somebody that to produce a music video. Um, for a Macklemore song. Uh, It's not a song yet. I only saw him spit one verse of it at this event, but I came up with this whole treatment and I want to make this music video and I need somebody to produce it. Like, are you down? And I was like, yes, I'm like 110% down because like, and this was ended up being Macklemore and Ryan Lewis's first ever music video. And again, the song wasn't even done yet. So through the entire process of working on it, I ended up co-writing the song and having a child a children's chorus sing it is called wings it's about like nike shoes and it ended up being this whole ass production but i just like threw myself i had never produced a music video before i had no idea like what that meant i would like barely knew how to operate a spreadsheet but i was like i am just like hungry to learn and i'm down to like get in and to collab and and that's really when um 
Macklemore and Ben and I met and and like that's also when he really gave me the confidence where he was like I really think that you are a great singer and you should really like pursue this like because at that point I had been doing like probably 90% rap and like 10% like singing my own hooks oh really and he was like he's like this is something like I feel like this and of course I like really you know like respected his opinion so of I was course. like okay I'll try I'll try to be a singer <laughs> isn't it funny how that like thing that you don't really focus on as much can actually be the thing that Completely. like is your thing for lack of a better term right um and I love that you told that story just because I think at face value when you just you know talk about I met Macklemore, became like homies, came, ended up working together. Like it sounds like uh, such like a fast trip to success, but I think it's important for people that are watching and hearing to know that like sometimes it's not that quick, right? No. It's like sometimes relationships take a long time and especially when they're genuine and like you don't have any any uh, false intentions, you know, on, on going into it. You know, sometimes you can meet somebody um, and uh, you may not reap the benefits of meeting that person until five years later, you know what I mean? If it's just genuine, like, connection or relationship with somebody. Totally. And I think, I think there's, it's not like there's two types of people. I think many people, many people who are successful in music are those people who are like, I was always a star. I was always a ham. I was on the table singing. I always knew I was going to be great. Like, that kind of vibe, that was, like, not me. I was the kind of person where it's like, if I just get to be in the room, how cool would it be if I could be on the road with these people? Like, for me... It, and sometimes I wonder to my detriment, like even, and Ben and I would even talk about this with Macklemore. Macklemore's like, I know how to rap. Like, I am a rapper. And there's such a clarity in that. And I'm like, I could do this. I could do that. I could do this other thing. Uh... Like, I, who could, like, you know, and it's not to say that he's not, I mean, he does all sorts of shit too. He's like, directs his own music video. He's a great stylist. Like, all of the things that you have to be to be a rapper, right? But like, you know, I think in ways like the way that I came to where I am now is nothing I could have imagined. I would have given myself a much more boring prediction in terms of where I'd be at this juncture in my life if I had had to decide on it when I was 20. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would have been like, I have a stable job and I live in a nice two bedroom apartment in this, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have given, I, I think I have a much more interesting life than I even imagined for myself because I was just like open to finding out. Um, and I think there's something really powerful in like knowing your, knowing your truth and knowing your path and manifesting it. That's never really personally been me. Like yeah. I've been like that person where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to collaborate with this artist that I admire just to soak up game. And then I end up, yeah, getting nominated for a Grammy. I mean, none of us would have imagined that. That is yeah. not why I signed up to be, a, you know, to work for free yeah. on a music video. <laughs> the younger you would be so proud of you, though, right? I think like, so. imagine if you were able to talk to like the 15 or 16 year old you and tell them where you're at today. Yeah. Like, how happy would that person be? That's true. You know her, what I mean? her ass hacking, hacking into downloading <laughs> songs on LimeWire. I'd be like, girl, Listen. there's this thing called Spotify. <laughs> Honestly, it's gonna ruin your it's life. It's gonna ruin your life. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know that's so funny with with like the streaming platforms the way they are today talk about like how you are talk about your opinion on like how you think they're changing the realm of music and the music industry and do you like it or do you not like it or do you have both varying opinions on it sure I think there's so much to be said I think you know again like just thinking even about 10 years ago like there was no Spotify. There was no Apple Music. Mm -hmm. Like these things that are absolutely dominant in our music industry and in our like music landscape now didn't even exist like 10 years ago. What's it going to be like in 10 years? Like we don't know. It's like this music is so interesting. You know, I think about it a lot because or I think about it in terms of like music itself is always kind of like changing and it's it's not like a film where it takes like two years to make or like 10 years to write and like come be brought to life like you could we could make a song right now and we could upload it to spotify and it could be there Ten tomorrow minutes, yeah you know what i mean and there's something really amazing about that and there's something really dope about that and it's also like there i think today you know the number always changes but is it like sixty thousand songs are uploaded like really? every day it's crazy every that's crazy to take day. in <laughs> and so it's kind of wild when you think about it because like for me as an artist like you know and i think a lot of artists like we're so precious about our music like we're so we put so much thought into it we put money into it time into it and then sometimes you can just feel really disposable right Sixty thousand songs a day like what the hell oh, like like kind of lost you feel lost completely in the, lost like in the sauce right like completely like just like a droplet in the ocean floating in the abyss and like I think obviously like I'm thankful that I think 
you know, due to whatever, like I have some insight into folks. Like I know some really amazing people working at these DSPs, right? Like, you know, anywhere from Amazon music to Spotify to Apple music, really thoughtful, amazing people who are like, I am championing music. But at a certain point, it's like the volume is just bananagrams, right? And that's good inherently because it means that everybody, as many people as possible have a shot. And then on the other hand, you know, back to what you were talking about, this kind of algorithmic recommendation and this kind of weird algorithmic competitiveness where at a certain point, in some senses, it's good because there's not the traditional gatekeepers. Yeah. But then, like, how trippy is it that the gatekeepers now aren't even really people? Yeah. They're, like, code. So it's it's a lot. I think it's, it's, uh, it's by turns exciting and discouraging as a recording artist today because on one hand, again, I really do feel like the folks that are working at these platforms, like the folks that I know, like, um, you know, I just shout out like my guy Frankie at Amazon Music or like I know Domo at Spotify. Like these people are doing really, really important cultural work. And especially mm-hmm. like those two people I mentioned, they're being really thoughtful about like Frankie on the Asian American side of things, Domo on like uh, on like supporting black music that's emerging in different regions that don't otherwise get heard. There's some really incredible curation that's happening. The mechanism as a whole, it feels really overwhelming. Yeah. And I think like can be really overwhelming for artists no matter what stage you're at in your artistry, whether yeah. you're just starting out or whether you've been doing this for a hell of a long time. It's really hard to navigate. And there's so much science that goes into it now Correct. with like a variety of different factors, whether it relates to anything that or in regards to the Insta, into the Instagram, yeah. <laughs> into the algorithm, right? right? So, I mean, at the end of the day, some of it is out of your control, but do you, with that being said, do you think that like, if you just focus on putting out good music, is that enough nowadays? Hell no. I don't think anybody, <laughs> would, I think zero out of 10 people would say that mm. it's enough. It's like, the bare minimum. But to the point though, the problem is that a lot of people feel like it's the other shit that makes you successful. And so uh, people will focus on this, that, and the third instead of making sure that their music's tight. That's true. Cause if you think about it, like a famous YouTuber who's never made a song before, if they put something out just because they have the audience, they're right. going to get a million streams. You know what I mean? And in some ways, again, it's, it's all things audience creation, how amazing is it? It used to be that you could not be a recording artist and create your own audience. You would have to depend Mm -hmm. on these gatekeepers, these labels, these um, platforms to, um, to create an audience for you. How amazing is it that you yourself like can create your own audience? Lil Nas X is like the perfect example of that. How do you engineer relevance? Like, and it's incredible to see this person that genuinely believed, like I have a song that could be, culture shifting did it and now he's making such an incredible like i stand him like i'm yeah. so impressed by the amount of c- true global pop cultural impact this man is making it's and it was memes like he just, <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. like he's a great story of like how it is an extremely exciting time to be an artist on the flip you can feel like you're fighting for scraps. You can feel, and especially folks that are trying, you know, what's the biggest way that you build an audience right now? Like you can build it over streaming, but oftentimes it's social media. And how are you doing that in a way? Like very often it's because you have to invest in it. And so now like the onus is on you to kind of do, like I have a friend, Nick Huff, who talks about this a lot. He's a YouTube creator. And it's kind of this new payola where creators feel like in order to get themselves in front and to build an audience, you have to pay these platforms who you're already giving these really valuable creative assets to for free. And they're building the valuation of their platforms. And maybe you're getting a few cents here and there on ads, but for the most part, it's like you're you're liter- paying literal money after you're giving them yeah. these assets like you've created. You're creating this. You're putting it on a platform, and then you have to pay again. Like that's it's crazy to wild. think about. Yeah, yeah. I never thought about it that way. Well, creators are now we're a consumer class, so it's mm-hmm. like it's yeah, it's pretty it's pretty wild. You gotta pay to play. Gotta pay to play. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. somebody's gotta pay. If somebody does have to pay. It's insane. So with being like an independent artist, talk about that. Do you? What are the downfalls for it for you, and what are the things that you enjoy about it? For sure. So obviously, like you know, again, my entrepreneurial spirit. Like I. I'm very used to DIY everything. Um, I haven't ever known any way other than independent artistry. And again, like coming up under Blue Scholars, Macklemore, like these were independent artists. And like obviously Macklemore was like this kind of like moonshot of independent 
artistic success that at the time was like really like people really hadn't seen any of that before. I also see, you know, being close to them and being like, oh, like you made significantly more or you were able to retain significantly more money <laughs> than many artists with of their same success just by virtue of the fact that they own the masters of their album and they, yeah. you know, like had a full ownership and they were basically their own in-house publishing company. And like, you know, there's a lot there where you're like, wow, the payoff can be so sweet if it gets to that level, right? But then there's also obviously the downside where again, you're in this hyper saturated landscape. Um, and you know, the why sometimes can get a little lost when you're doing stuff. I think for me also like self promotion has never really been like come second nature to me. Like I think that some people are so good at like even just visually crafting images for themselves, let alone like being really persistent and consistent about promoting themselves and like being in front and like that kind of thing. Like, I don't know. Like, it's just harder for me. Like I, my TikTok is hella sad. I have like four <laughs> cooking videos Mind and you. like, I'm just like, okay, well that was fun. Like, you know, I'm, just, I think I'm more of just kind of like, I just like to be in with people and like consume stuff. And I don't know. It's just hard for me sometimes to think about like being like a capital C content creator, like, that's essential to being an artist now. Yeah. And that sometimes can be the hardest thing for me. Like I love music. I will write music all day. Like, and I think what I realized during the pandemic is like creating music is like so, so important for my mental health and just for my overall well being, um, in a way that I took for granted pre pandemic for sure. Um, and I had to figure that out, you know, like had to figure out how to make music in isolation, how to collaborate in isolation. Um, but that whole like content creation, like I can produce stuff. Like I produce music videos. I love working with teams, but like when it's like you, like you as the brand, like that's not, it does not come naturally to yeah. me. So I'm trying to be better <laughs> at it because I know it's important. <laughs> yeah. But you like to, um, you like to, you don't, so do you not like to like necessarily be the forefront? You like to have like work on something where somebody else is the forefront? Kind is of. A... Like, I think for me, it's just like the thing that motivates me the most is connecting with people and collaborating with people. Okay. That's a great way to so put it. So it's like, that's why I love making music videos. Like, for example, not to toot my own horn, but I produced the thrift shop music video. And I mm. love, obviously, like, it's a very good example of what I'm able to do as a producer. Yeah, but also sorry. what I love about that music video is I'm like, this is such a, ca it captures such a moment. It's so true to, like, who we are. It's, like, all of our friends. It's all of the places we went. It was all the literal thrift stores we went to, the places we went on Capitol Hill, the random, like, uh, parking lot that we got kicked out of, and then where I had to make a call somewhere else, and then we filmed the DeLorean scene. So, you know, and I just, like, I look at that, and I'm so proud as a creator, even though you don't see my face anywhere in the video. Yeah. Um, but it's, like, I... I loved that experience because I felt like it was like a pure, like greater than the sum of our parts collaboration. And we were able to make something really, really tight. And that's what drives me. Okay. So it's the purpose. The purpose. Or yeah. Or just like, why do we create, you know, like mm -hmm. why do we make things um, and bring them to life? It's like, for me again, it's that connectivity and it's that, it's that collaboration. It's getting to like work with people and just be like, damn, we like did that. Like none of us could have done that on our own and nobody else could have done it but us. Yeah. And I think that's like what I was so proud about the thrift shop video, for example, because I was just like, you like this video was massively successful and you, if you gave somebody like a million dollars in LA, they could not have made that music video. Mm-hmm. There's no way they could have recreated like the texture of it, like that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's just some, there was something like really pure about it, and I'm proud of it. And yeah. like, you know, I think for me moving forward, it's like that's what drives me. That's what lights me up. That's what I like, can gets tell. Me excited. You're, yeah, you're very so, passionate when you speak about yeah, it. Yeah. So awesome. it's like you know, thinking about now as a creator, it's like you know, I'm gearing up now to make a music. I'm going to direct a music video for my next single, and it's like that kind of like I'm scared, and I'm like you know, I'm, I'm, it's partially driven by fear, but also it's just like, how can I challenge myself to create something? And I have such dope collaborators. Like I love the people that I work with on videos and it's like how, like, that's what gets me excited more than anything. That's really cool though, because you're making the songs, performing the songs, and right. then you also get to direct the, the music video for it. So it's kind of like all encompassing where it's like, you get to visually bring the art to life and you all, and you get to have a say in how this is being seen totally. um, visually rather than just audio for via auto, right? Yeah. Audio, yeah, yeah, for sure. What impact did um, 
slam poetry and spoken word have in your art now? Because I know that's something that you were very involved in when you were younger, right? Yeah, for sure. So that was like, I had never even like written a song, but I went to a, a poetry slam when I was a sophomore, I think, in high school, and my friend George Watsky, shout out to Watsky. Very good with names. <laughs> yes, um, was competing um, at this teen poetry slam that was produced by this organization called Youth Speaks. And um, it was wild because it was like at the Opera House, it was at the San Francisco Opera House, but it was like young people reading poetry they had written themselves, like no instrumentation, no props, like very simple. And I think I was just so drawn to like, how raw and powerful it was just for young people to speak their own words. Like I had been in theater and I had known like the power of like coming together to do a production on the stage, but I was just like, damn, this is like 10 times more powerful than any like yeah, musical I had been super a part intimate. of. Just one person and their poetry. And I was just like, damn, like that's, I want to do that. Um, so I got into that. And then when I moved to Seattle, like that was the first creative community I got into. And thankfully it was also really like, there's a lot of connectivity between the poetry scene and the music scene and the hip hop scene um, and like artists that kind of identified as both, you know, so um, the kind of open mic scene, like uh, I, you know, when I moved to Seattle, I was uh, attending Youth Speak Seattle where I'd eventually like be a teaching artist and we would do weekly writing circles where like folks like you know, anywhere, just like multi-generational, like it was like people who are 15 and it was people who were like 55 and we would all come together and we would write together and read what we wrote together. And it was just this really like liberating creative feeling where it's not like, it does not have to be perfect when it comes out of your mouth. And like that kind of led me to like, you know, ciphering and freestyling and the idea of just kind of like creating on the spot improvisation and, and really not just being really like, again, liberated in your creative expression and that I think really, really drew me in a way that like, again, like my theater, like the choir and just the formality of that, it was like the opposite of that. And I was like, I fuck with this. <laughs> um, so yeah. So I mean, poetry to this day, like I was just thinking, like I was at the studio today and we had like a Sylvia Plath book on the counter and I brought, um, a poetry book by Hanif Durakib as well. And I just like, I'm always like, I still am always very in touch with poetry. I don't really identify or write poetry or I don't identify as a poet, nor do I write poetry anymore per se, but like songwriting to me is poetry. Yeah. So, for sure. um, and I'm always really inspired by literature and I'm always like reading books, um, and like thinking about, you know, taking phrases or thinking about how themes of that can be translated into song. And for you, it seems like this is a reoccurring theme for you. Just like involving yourselves, yourself in arts that are more like avenues of expression for you. Like, it seems just like that's, that's what is like, has the biggest impact on you and like ways that you can express yourself like artistically. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, so you have some singles coming out, right? I do. Talk about that. There's one in September and there's one in October. Which the, what's the one in September coming out? Um, so I just had a song call, come out called Less Like, um, and that uh, came out in June. And so that was the first single of this album that's going to be coming out uh, in the fall, winter. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, You'll, anyway, our timelines are <laughs> flexible. Um, but it's an album that I wrote entirely during COVID. So, um, you know, and a lot of those sessions were written, were done over Zoom. Um, actually, the only song that I wrote in the studio was the song that's coming out next, which is called Let Me Not. And it's produced by Ryan Lewis and uh, co-written with my friend Keely, a.k.a. Dressage. So, um, yeah, that's the one that I'm going to be directing the music video for. Oh, cool. And that's going to be coming out in September. And, yeah, I'm hype on it. It kind of, like, has this, like, raw energy. It definitely is kind of like a it's ripped out of the pages of my journal, like, uh, has like a rawness and a very like meanness that I'm excited about, but it's like definitely a new sonic texture than anything I've ever done before. So I'm hype on it. What kind of sound can we expect from that? Great question. Uh, this one, it's like a lot, there's a lot of like velocity to it, if that makes any sense. Like there's a lot of energy. It's like, um, it's not a headbanger, but it definitely kind of has some like raw rock energy to it. Um, and I think it's that just that like catharsis that we so all wanted like during the pandemic. Uh, like <laughs> so, just, so that could be felt yeah. in the song itself. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, can you expect that from like, can we expect that from the album as well? Or like... The album definitely trends like a lot more like alt rock than anything else I've done before. Like I've usually been like, again, like rap, like R and B, um, and more kind of on the pop tip. And so this definitely kind of embraces the more like, 
you know, indie for lack of a better word and like all vibe that has shaped me as well sonically gotcha and what about subliminal i know that's dropping october right yes yeah, so um so that's the album um and there's a song on there called subliminal oh, that's yeah the album. so the, yeah, the okay. album's called subliminal and um yeah i i wrote that song with my guy chucky kim who um he produced my the first single i ever released solo sedative uh he produced that and he's one of my closest collaborators and him and i probably wrote like 15 to 20 songs over the pandemic and wow. subliminal was a really important one for me because I was fresh off this conversation. Um, I was doing a small virtual group of folks that we were all doing the artist way. I don't know if you're hip to that book, mm. um, book by Julia Cameron, the artist way. It's a 12 week course for people to like unearth and discover their inner creative. And it's a really, you know, it's kind of this canonical book for, for artists and, um, I had never seen it all the way through. And again, I like doing things in collaboration and in community. So I was like, let's <laughs> all do this together. So I had just been in a conversation with some folks that had been doing that program um, or been in my group. And we were just talking about like, oh, you know, like we we're always just vying to be something bigger and better, but like, we're already there. Like kind of like what you had mentioned, like your 15 year old self would be so, but you know, yeah. just like really trying to take a moment. And I've also been working on this project with the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American center called brave space, which is like a collaboration or sorry, it's a compilation of Asian American women, artists, um, musicians and, uh, producers and songwriters making music that kind of touches on spirituality and meditation in a way that has usually been like commodified by Western culture. Um, and so I've been thinking about that, like thinking about meditative music and like, what's the meditation or the mantra that I want to create. And so, yeah, the first two lines of the song subliminal, which is like the title track of the album is like, you know, you've been straining to prove who you are, but you're already here. Yeah. Like, and that's kind of like what I tried to really tell myself and think about what's the lessons that I'm getting from the pandemic. Like we were so busy. We were like, you know, like every hour is booked up like and then this pandemic happens where we're all just like chilling Shut and like down. very much being alone with ourselves and like what is what does it mean to be present in this moment so that's why I, yeah i chose for that album or for that song that i created kind of for the brave space project to end up being the title of the album because it's just i feel like that's the sentiment i really want to leave with despite all of the like angst and the <laughs> tension of dealing with everything pandemic related yeah i love how that all ties together and i think it's cool because you mentioned outside of music your other passion is like community activism mm -hmm. so it's kind of like you're tying those two worlds together mm -hmm. in that sense with what you explained so talk about that as well like community activism talk about why that's so important for you and um some of the endeavors that you've been involved in throughout your life with community activism for sure so i think like i don't really particularly like identify as an activist because i feel Often, like, I mean, even the notion of activism, like, MAGA people, like, far right, Can like, anti vaxxers would consider themselves to be <laughs> activists. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I'm like, what does activism really mean? Like, I just try to be, like, an involved person in community. And I see, you know, my artistry as an extension of that. And kind of going back to what we were talking about with poetry and spoken word, like, the community that I became a part of in the Bay and then eventually in Seattle, like, community like organizing and social change work and social justice work was like embedded in the very fabric of those communities. Like it was not, you know, this was not like a, this is not like an industry boot camp where we're all trying to figure out how we're like individually as artists going to like make it. Like the whole point was like, how are we coming together to like make the world a better place and in a real actualized way? How are we using poetry to speak on injustices? Like, and to speak on how, you know, like frankly fucked up a lot of these systems are that we live in. Um, thinking about, you know, I mean, a lot of the topics of like the young people doing poetry was like, you know, like racism, mm -hmm. social oppression, like social inequity, just like they, that's a lot of what impacts and shapes and defines who we are. And so like, that's obviously what would the, the art would be about. And like, I think to me more than anything, when I saw the power of spoken word poetry, I was like, not only is it just powerful on its own as performance, but it's really, it's, it has the ability to truly shift society. Like I really felt it 
palpably and like viscerally when I was there. Um, you know, at any at any event, it's like how do you create? You know, how do you create a better world? You have to create the world that you wish to see. And how can you create the world you wish to see? You do it in community with people. So yeah, yeah. that's always just kind of in the ethos of why I created. I think that's the reason why I'm so passionate about it. Um, and I frankly have like the privilege and the resources to be able to, you know, like try to dedicate myself as much as possible. I definitely feel a responsibility to like do what I can. Um, and to hopefully leverage my platform to be able to have influence and impact on creating a, a more just world. Like, why else are we here? What, what's the <laughs> point? So, um, yeah. So I think for me, it was just like inherent and embedded in the communities that I came up in. Um, and yeah, especially in Seattle, I mean, just like there's been really tremendous activism and organizing that's happened to really shift things in a really incredible direction. And obviously like, it became like kind of this national hotspot news in Seattle, like, um, over last year, but it was like a lot of my friends and people and community that were at, on the front lines, like at the forefront. Um, and you know, I'm always there to be of support and in solidarity with their work and like, you know, I, I just feel like there's no, again, like I hate the branding aspect of my artistry. And so it's like, what's the point of that? The point of it is that hopefully I can just develop my platform as much as possible as an artist to be able to leverage that, to provide resource to that. I mean, ideally I'd love to make a ton of fucking money and be able to like distribute it, you know, yeah. like whatever. So <laughs> like, what's the point? It has to be bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. Like I just can't, I can't imagine being motivated by just soul like my individual success like yeah. it's not interesting to me have you have you always been this way or is this something that uh has changed throughout your life due to experiences that's a great question i think again like going back to like me sneaking onto the internet and getting on message boards like yeah. i just really appreciate being in community i think that's what drives me more than anything like being in like intentional and like true and like dynamic community with people. And okay. I think I thankfully was able to, as a young person, find, you know, communities that were, who really gave a fuck about racial justice, social justice, uh, calling shit out, shifting things, pushing against the status quo. I feel like I'm very grateful to have like, you know, read, you know, a lot of like seminal texts and like black organizing and black liberation when I was like a teen. And so it just, I feel that's my foundation. And like, that's what I'm thankful for to you know, now, like, especially, you know, we've seen in the last year, obviously a lot of like Asian American activism and community coming together. And, you know, a lot of folks like Asian American folks, like kind of for the first time thinking about community organizing and like pushing against the status quo and, yeah. you know, and learning about history and, um, Again, I just feel really grateful. I feel really privileged that, like, coming up in poetry, coming up in hip hop, like, hip hop is inherently social activism yeah, in a sense. You know what I mean? So, so it's like, how, like, again, like that, because that was my foundation and, like, because I'm so driven by community, it's just like, that's really like, it's, that's just, it's just baked into who I ended up being. It's kind of <laughs> like the perfect storm for you, like, all these variables in your life, like, yeah. where you grew up all experiences you had yeah. and what you involved yourself with kind of <laughs> like everyone, right? Yeah. yeah, it's very true. Like everyone. Awesome. It's funny how just like where you grow up has such a big impact on the person you, you are. Like oh, I hell yeah. can only imagine how different my life would be or your life would be if you like grew up in Nebraska or totally. something. You know what I mean? I know. And yeah. my dad grew up in Nebraska. It's oh, really? like, damn. I mean, like he was born there, okay. but yeah, but I mean, just like, yeah, I mean, totally completely. And yeah, yeah I just feel grateful. Feel Me grateful too. to be a child of the West coast. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Grateful. I feel so grateful to be from LA and just have had the experience that I have because Sure. I would hate to be like any other way than myself, like everyone else, <laughs> I guess. Sure. Awesome, Hollis. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Um, any last words for, for the audience before you hop off here? Not really. Just, you know, um, thankful for your time and having me. And just, yeah, it's, it's, I think I just, if anything, I just want to send love to all the creatives out there that have been feeling pummeled by uh, the last year and a half. And especially mm -hmm. those of us who perform live and just like, we thought we were good and now it's not looking good. And just like, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Keep making, keep creating. It matters. Keep thinking about how you can push, um, you know, to be a greater version of yourself and do work that's beyond yourself. Um, and yeah, just keep 
feeling responsible for making the world a better place and shit. <laughs> and shit. <laughs> I love it. No, that was awesome. I appreciate you coming on. You dropped a lot of good knowledge and honestly, I admire you as a creative Thank and you. what you do for your purpose. So Thank you. awesome from ambiance. This is Levi Hollis checking out. Peace and blessings to everybody. Peace. Peace.